Hey, what's up everybody? Today we're going to talk about menopause and what we women can do to thrive instead of just barely survive. Some women can spend up to 10 years in menopause, which is crazy to me, and we just don't talk about it openly enough. So that's going to change today. I'm Risa Morimoto, your host, and you're watching Modern Aging, where we chat about innovative and holistic ways to elevate our health and well-being as we age. When you click on that subscribe button with that little bell next to it, you'll be sure to be notified whenever a new episode is uploaded. You could also check out our website at thisismodernaging.com for upcoming programs. Today, my guest is Amanda Thieb. She wrote this incredible book called Menapocalypse. I just finished reading it. She's a fitness and women's health expert. She, at the age of 43, went from barely surviving to thriving in menopause. It took her two years to get diagnosed she has a crazy story, but it did inspire her to write this book so that other women don't have to go through what she has gone through. We're going to go, we're going to talk about some of the symptoms that you might see, some of the treatments that you might see, and then also what you can do as hacks at home to be able to thrive during this period of your life. I think it's great for women. I also think it's really important for men to read this book as well. So I'm excited to talk to her, Amanda. So check it out. joining me today. I am loving, loving, loving this book. It's so important. Thank you so much for writing it. Thank you for having me on. I've got my copy too, just in case you didn't have yours. <laughs> like I'm about same shameless self-promotion and there you go. <laughs> well, no, it's really important. So can you just start off and tell me why did you write this book? Um, I am 49, about to turn 50. And when I was in my early 40s, I sort of went through a phase of feeling a little bit smug. You know, I am a fitness trainer, nutrition coach. And as I like powered into my 40s, I felt really good, healthy and strong. And then I started feeling unwell and I think I was about 42 43 when it happened and I started getting intense symptoms of vertigo and nausea and generally not feeling well to the point where I was sort of like bedridden you know when you just don't feel good and you can't get out of bed that's and scary I, it, yeah yeah and at first I thought it was a virus but then it and it lifted and then it came back again and came back again and and um, I got to the point where I thought I was going crazy because I went to the doctors who referred me to multiple specialists, neurologists thinking it was a mi like migraines, ear, nose and throat doctor to do testing. I had um, CT scans, balance testing, MRI scans, you name it. For two years, I had all of these different tests and doctors never could come up with a reason why I was unwell. In fact, one doctor turned around, to, and I don't wear sickness well, by the way, like, and I look like crap. And so one of the doctors turned around to me and went, you clearly aren't well, but I don't know what's wrong with you. And so I yeah. was like in a fit of despair. And I also went through some uh, mental health issues as well. I started, I didn't realize, I, well, I think circumstantially, but also because what well, I found out later was because of um, perimenopause, but I was in a deep, dark place where I really just didn't want to get through the day. I wasn't at the point where I was suicidal, but I really didn't enjoy getting up in the morning. I didn't enjoy my family, my husband, my work, anything. And um, wow. then, um, long story short, I went to my routine annual gynecologist appointment, which is usually one of those um, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, you know, get out in five minutes. And he was about to go on his lunch break. And as he walked out the door, the gynecologist looked at me and said, are you okay? And I was like, no. And I started crying. And you know how doctors make you cry? And I couldn't stop crying. And I just said, I, I don't recognize myself, actually. I, I don't feel well. I don't, I can't even tell you what's wrong with me. I'm like, if I was trying to describe my symptoms, they change. I don't know how often they come. It's so random and I just don't feel like I'm reaching any type of like capacity during the day and he said this sounds very typical of perimenopause and he says and and these symptoms are valid and I can help you let me help you oh wow and it was just like oh my god and then and actually what I said was like 
um, F you, which I'm not, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on your show. I know I'm a, I know I've got a foul mouth, but I turned around and just said, there's no way I'm in like going into menopause. I'm 43 years old. Look at me. And he was like, this is the age when women start going through perimenopause. And I went, what does perimenopause mean? I don't even know that word. So it was one of those like light bulb moments, but I was also really confused. And so that was the start of everything for me because I went home. I had I had and have a fitness blog, which I'm very bad at writing on, but I wrote this article called The Shite That Nobody Tells You About Perimenopause. And I just did a, just a rant. I just ranted and typed um, and it went crazy. It was sort of like it, you have a, a, an article that goes sort of viral-ish. Well, it did. And, and women were like, thank you for writing this. Thought I was going crazy. And so, so tell me, what is perimenopause for those who yes. may not know what it is? Yeah, so what what is the whole shebang really? What's going on? And um and so I basically started digging deep into the research and speaking to experts, and and so we can break per, we can pr- break menopause into three sort of areas. You have perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. Perimenopause literally means the time leading up to menopause. It's a period of approximately eight to 10 years. For me, it was eight years. Um, And it's where our hormones, our sex hormones start to decline. Eight to 10 years? Yes, right? Like, hang on. I was like, stop the bus here. Like, shut the door. (laughs) What? Nobody... No, what? Nobody ever told me I had to expect this in my 40s, like in school, like in any like books I've read, like anatomy and physiology in all the fitness and health books I've read. Anyway, so that was like a real eye opener for me and all of the things that I was feeling. So I was a red. Originally, I didn't know what was happening. The gynecologist said I was struggling with vestibular migraines, vertigo, depression. I also started peeing my pants, so I had vaginal atrophy happen. Oh, that's um, sexy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my libido changed. You know, like, oh. my, mo- my moods changed. Like, things started happening. that, And I started getting allergies. Never had them in my life. And so... Oh, when I found out what perimenopause is, so this eight to 10 years leading up to menopause is when women are most symptomatic. Um, and so that's a long period of time to not know what's going on. And so our um, sex hormones start to decline um, because we no longer need to reproduce. And so our estrogen and our progesterone start to decline, but it's the de- declining estrogen that causes us the problems, most of the problems. Um, is it, it more like a wave or is it just kind of like more like a... No, exactly. It's exactly like you said, the progesterone tends to be a bit more of a linear decline, but the estrogen fluctuates all over the place. In fact, it's almost like this crazy random, It's it, you can't determine when it's going to rise or fall. And it's just one of those things that happens to us and we have to go through it in order to reach menopause and so because the hormones fluctuate your perimenopause or is our mind could be completely different how our body reacts to them are completely different if we're fit if we're healthy what our genetics are you know it all comes into play and our our lifestyle too now i had a particularly bad perimenopause but i was fit healthy and you know had a good lifestyle but clearly there was other things at work there right and wow. then after we after we um have not had a and, and at the same time i might add your periods might continue to be exactly the same you may start losing periods you might may start having more frequent periods you may start birthing aliens that's what i did i would have like <laughs> periods for 30 days where i would just lose my body and go this has got to be the final exodus. And then it would happen all over again. Like what? Crazy. One month? One month. I actually got, I had to go and get um, iron tablets because I did start getting <laughs> anemia. Yeah, it was, it's wow. crazy. And, and you speak to friends and other women and have these anecdotal conversations and everybody's story will be different. But it's a, it's a shared journey. 
And so menopause is the time when you have not had a period for 12 months. And it's sort of like a line in the sand. It's almost like a point in time. But from that day forward, you are then menopausal um, or sometimes called postmenopausal. Um, so all those men- symptoms go away once you're in menopause. You'd like to think. <laughs> I would but no, like, my husband would like, like to think. <laughs> I remember my husband turned around to me and said, is menopause, does it make you more horny? And I was like, oh my God, men. (laughs) Their their mind is always in the gutter. But well, for me, it didn't. I did have these moments of extreme, like crawl in the wall, horniness, but it was very infrequent for me. Um, When menopause happens and you go into post-menopause, um, a lot of those crazy erratic symptoms do tend to die down because the hormones are stabilizing. But um, some symptoms stay with women and they don't go away or they take a long time to go away. Things like um, sleep disturbances, insomnia, night sweats, cold sweats, hot flashes, um, vaginal atrophy, which is sometimes known as the genio uteri utinary symptoms of menopause gsm and it's sometimes called that because it isn't just the vagina it's the the whole pelvic floor area does lose a little bit of integrity because of the low estrogen and so things like um incontinence people are going to hate me when i say these incontinence vaginal dryness um lots of yeast infections and urinary tract infections painful sex tearing um what? like some people thinning <laughs> of the skin like yeah and that if yeah. you do if you do struggle with um vaginal atrophy it's not something that gets better and that's a really hard thing to hear because if you're a woman that's really struggling like and it's painful to have sex or you're bleeding or you're tearing you can't go through life being like that but there are very safe Um, treatments available to you and I highly recommend a woman going to a gynecologist that's trained in this area because you can take treatment that you can be on for the rest of your life that will bring your life back because these type of symptoms ruin women's quality of life well that's good to know that there's actual treatments for it though there is right but it's something you have to continually take care of um and as far as things like um incontinence what can also help with that is i mean just in general our muscles start to decline as we get older i do touch on this in the book and i i won't go into it too much but um, your pelvic floor area may just be weak and so seeking out a pelvic health physiotherapist could also be a great sort of like addition to your toolbox um because incontinence it's very, very common, and it's should, but it's not normal, and it shouldn't happen. And there's treatments to help you with that too. I just think that a lot of women get very embarrassed and shy and don't want to go to the doctor and go, yeah, I pee my pants literally every time I cough. <laughs> it's really hard to be that open and forthright, but you have to advocate for yourselves, ladies. Life's yeah. too important, right? So the, you've got the three stages, perimenopause and postmenopause. And then there's a chunk of women as well that will go into either some type of forced menopause. That can be from um, chemicals, from um, cancer treatments or surgeries such as a hysterectomy that removes their ovaries. And those women have get hit hard because they usually go into immediate menopause and it's a struggle. It's like a, a life changer for them. Wow. So could they have any of those symptoms if they go into forced menopause? They they often have a lot of symptoms and they have a lot of um, intense symptoms. I mean, one of the, the biggest complaints from women who are, are, are post um, breast cancer, breast cancer survivors, are joint pain, um, vaginal problems that we've just discussed, migraines, hot flashes, all of those are all linked to to declining estrogen. Because what's very interesting about menopause and what I think what's missing from the conversation is that women think estrogen is just something produced in the ovaries and that it just is all to do with our periods and nothing else. And then our periods stop and then la 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 la, we go into old age. But there's estrogen receptors riddling the body they're all over the body they're in our joints they're in our our small intestine they're in they they cross our blood brain barrier so brain fog 
losing words, like short-term retention are real problems for women. And they struggle going into perimenopause thinking they've got Alzheimer's. And right. women are, are at wow. a higher higher risk of Alzheimer's post-menopause. So it's very important to be knowledgeable about the different symptoms that can happen in, menop- in perimenopause through to menopause and then how you can manage them. Wow. Okay, now that I'm completely <laughs> well, suppressed. Let's just all breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the good news, people. No. Um, well, I think that the, I want I want to go into treatments, but I do want to just um, kind of touch upon hot flashes because I feel like that's the the known um, menopause symptom, right? If you have hot flashes, if you start having hot flashes, that means you're perimenopausal. So, what's happening when you actually do get a hot flash? So it's very interesting, right? So um, they do not know exactly why hot flashes happen. There's been studies and studies to try and find out exactly why it happens. It's definitely got to do with the hypothalamus. It's the regulatory part of the brain that regulates body temperature. And it's, there's a connection with estrogen there. And when, they, when your estrogen is fluctuating and declining, the body is constantly trying to find like a, the appropriate body temperature and it works through the hypothalamus. And so what will happen is as it starts to chug, 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 women get from their toes to the top of their head, these surges. And it's not just a case of going, ooh, I'm feeling a bit like flushed. These women, like, and I actually have only ever had like two or three I haven't struggled with hot flashes but when I had them I was like it's like an alien invasion in your body it's like really hard to describe but it surges up really quickly and it like women sweat and burn and then freeze and then go freezing cold and some women can have between like 20 and 30 of these a day and it's actually really hard to manage and I think that the reason that people associate hot flashes as the like symptom of menopause is it's probably one of the most common but as we dig deeper and women are starting to be more open about menopause it's just one of many 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 symptoms um but like this is one of those symptoms that does tend to carry on into post-menopause and it can keep women awake at night um you know like the the hot flashes can sort of like translate into these night sweats women are getting like five hours sleep a night three four hours and it's ruining their lives and also think about what that does to us on a stress management level it's very very hard to manage your day and your cortisol levels when you're running on nothing sleep is so important yeah, and so, nice. and so like, it's like, I hear like women will say, what can I do about them? What's the things I can do about hot flashes? Well, literally for any symptom of menopause, the number one um, treatment that doctors should offer you, like the first line treatment is hormone replacement therapy. Now, hormone replacement therapy is sort of considered controversial, but it shouldn't be anymore. What happened in 2002 is a report from the WHI was um, released that categorically stated that, amongst other things, um, estrogen therapy caused breast cancer. And it's took a lot of years and a lot of research is disputing that claim to finally get to the point where we know that that's not an accurate statement. Um, But the problem is with fear-based marketing, what do we do? We remember those things. Now, there's going to be some women that aren't candidates for estrogen therapy. And usually they're the women who have had breast cancers that are estrogen positive. But there are still some breast cancers that will allow you to take hormone replacement therapy. You just need to go to your specialist and find out if you're a candidate. There is a brilliant book called Estrogen Matters by Dr. Avram Blooming and Dr. Carol Tavris that I would recommend as well as reading my book, but read these book. These are two researchers. Um, Dr. Avram Blumen is a world-renowned oncologist, breast cancer oncologist, who talks about the safety of estrogen. Estrogen is not a carcinogenic substance. Now, what happens is um, if you're a candidate for 
hormone therapy, your doctor can offer you um, estrogen and you have to have a progesterone with the estrogen to protect your uterus. If you no longer have a uterus, you can go on estrogen only therapy. That's the current standard. Now, most women can go on it. There's not many women that can't go on it, but lots of women still get turned away from their doctors when asking for hormone therapy because doctors are not educated in menopause management. Right. In, in school currently, the fellowships of OBGYNs, only 20% of those people, those students, will, take, will opt to take a course on man, um, management of menopause symptoms. So there's a huge failing in the medical system for women, but there are specialists out there and there are resources to be able to find them. And I, if a woman is really struggling, she needs to know that she doesn't need to. There are people out there that can offer safe, safe treatments to help them. For, for nearly all symptoms, women who are having a chronic amount of symptoms, usually this micro dose of estrogen and progesterone, and it usually is a micro dose, probably like 100 times less than the birth control pill is enough just to calm the storm because that's literally what we need, you know. So what did you do in terms of treatment? Well, so when I was um, diagnosed by my gynecologist as, as having perimenopause, the first treatment they offered me was um, hormone replacement therapy. And I told him to stick it where the sun don't shine because I also believed at that time that it was not a safe option. And I was horrified that he would offer me that. Um, and then he offered me an antidepressant. And the antidepressant was actually um, used to manage migraines. It was an off-label benefit of this antidepressant would that would actually manage the migraines. And it did. And it did give me back enough quality of life that I could start living again. But then I started having other symptoms of menopause, like the vaginal atrophy, um, and amongst other things, and some joint pain and some the chronic fatigue that can come with it too. And like I needed something else. And so that's when I went on. And by this time, I'd also like dug knee deep into the research, sp spoken to so many experts. I felt very happy and confident with my choice. And I went to my doctor, who refused me. And so I told him I was going to take him to a medical tribunal if he didn't give me it. And I actually gave him a list of FDA approved bioidentical hormones that were a safe dose for me. And he gave me them. And then two days later, emailed me and apologized for not being current. So, you know, I think that you can help your doctors because they often don't know. And the resources are out there on many of the like menopause medical sites that can help you like get to your doctor and ask for what's what's necessary. And so what happened once you started taking it? The symptoms just died down. It was amazing. Like wow. I actually really struggled to find a dose that worked for me. And I think that that's me. I think I'm a fickle bitch that just really struggles with everything I do. I think that's been my, my sauce in life. But, um, I'm on like the lowest, lowest dose you can get. And it's just, it just seems to be an, like enough, like the, um, my, I'm now postmenopausal. I have been for a year and I'm sort of young to go through that. And that's maybe why the doctors think I had such a rough time in perimenopause. Um, the only sort of like symptoms I have are some vaginal atrophy issues that completely go as soon as I'm on HRT and, um, some sleep issues. And my sleep issues weren't bad, but I would wake up in the middle of the night and not be able to get back to sleep. And I hate that. I don't want to give up my sleep for anyone. And so it really has improved my quality of life. But the thing that women don't realize about estrogen therapy is that it's also preventative. So as we go into postmenopause, it can help manage symptoms that you may have, but it's also been shown to help like help fight some of the diseases that diseases that kill us cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer of women and it's linked to low estrogen it's been linked um also um diabetes insulin you, you become more, more insulin resistant as your estrogen declines wow. and so so all of the yeah. 
Yeah, and so this is why the Estrogen Matters book is really great. I also touch on it in my book as well. I just think that women, if they know that they can do things to improve their health as they go forward, a really interesting fact as well is that osteoporosis is a massive killer of women. 40,000 women die a year of osteoporosis, um, and it's really hard to prevent that unless you really actively try and do that. So we know strength training can help promote bone growth. We know that when you pull the muscle away from the bone in a strength training activity, it creates bone growth. So that's something women can do. Estrogen therapy can also help because it improves the tensile strength of your bone, which is the inside core of the bone. The, when you take your calcium and vitamin D, it's sort of protecting the outer shell, but it's not really protecting the, the inner workings of the bone, the bit that breaks. And so, um, so, so estrogen therapy has been linked with improved um, outcomes of osteoporosis. So like, if we know that we can do things actively to promote our health, then we should do that. Now, yeah. like I said, there's going to be some women that can't take estrogen therapy, and that's, fi that's fine. There's still other things they can do to sort of like look after their health. But it's just to really try and take the fear away from women and tell them that there's valid options out there. They just need to speak to the right people. So what would you say are some of the other things that people can do, that women can do to have a little bit of a smoother ride with menopause or perimenopause? So I think, um, like this might not, this might seem like a bit of a lame answer, but I think that knowledge is power. So I really struggled with perimenopause much more until I found out what I was dealing with. And then at least I knew what I was facing. And I think that that really helps. Like, so when I was struggling with this like chronic fatigue and it wouldn't lift and I just felt like a failure of a human, I just would lie on the sofa, sofa thinking, look at me, I'm like a waste of space. But then when I realized that this was sort of like some of the downsides of the hormones fluctuating, then I sort of gave myself a bit of grace and it was I was able to say, I don't care, I'm going to sit on the sofa and watch Downton Abbey for two hours and so be it like I sort of was able to sort of like reframe the journey going forward so I think um being knowledgeable is so helpful I think that finding a community that helps you is so helpful a shared experience really really helps in these um these circumstances and historically women never spoke about menopause did they our mothers well just they still don't <laughs> They still don't. And I remember saying to my mum, what was your menopause like? She said, oh, I don't remember. It was ages ago. And then only recently, and I've been going through this for eight years, she went, you know what? I used to get migraines in menopause. And I'm like, geez, mother. <laughs> it would have been good to know. But really, actually, my experience was nothing like hers. But even just having the conversation, I sat down with her my sister-in-law, who's a bit younger than me, and my niece, who's 18, and we had a conversation about menopause. And it was really great to hear all perspectives. Even my 18-year-old niece who just said, why don't you, we learn about this at school when we learn about our periods and having babies? That's stupid. But the UK now are going to teach this in school. Oh, which that's is great. great. That's They're going great. to at least, at least raise awareness about it. That's great. Um, but, you know, I come from a health and wellness background. I'm a personal trainer and nutrition coach, and I do believe in the power of harnessing those things to help support the journey. And I, I'm very clear about this in my book that I don't think that sometimes it's doing these things can, like, they're not sure or cure you because we're not looking to do that. But you need to know that some things are actually made easier by the choices you make in life. And so... Even if you just try and do a couple of the things that I suggest in, in the book, that you might find that it things do calm down a little bit. For example, hot flashes that you mentioned earlier. There's been two amazing studies done, and they were only done last year, that showed the benefits of starting a resistance training program, like a strength training program, in your perimenopausal years and even starting one when you're postmenopausal can reduce hot flashes by 70%. Wow. There is an there is an association between building and maintaining lean body mass, which is literally just the amount of muscle you have compared to fat. So your lean muscle mass um, and reduced hot flashes. Now, so that's something you can do. 
if you're really struggling with hot flashes and you don't want to take HRT, then why not try strength training? What have you got to lose? And there's like a zillion, trillion benefits to strength training. I have a whole chapter on my book and a 12-week program because I want all women to know that it can really aid them when they as they get older. That's you can awesome. you can change your life with the food you eat, the exercise you do, and then the other two things that really matter to me and they're really boring and no one likes to talk about are stress management but cortisol critical. and estrogen are intrinsically linked and it's critical like you said lack of sleep and even just um talking about good stress versus bad stress so what i see all the time in midlife women as a court who's trained lots of women and from personal experience is that we start to have doubts about ourselves about our self-esteem about our athletic ability about what we can and can't do women all the time will say i can't do that anymore or i don't think i can do that and it's not true and the thing is we need to start pushing that envelope a little bit good stress is really important for us i like to use the analogy of the roller coaster you know when you stood in line at a roller coaster and you don't want to go on and it's so stressful and you're just going oh my god i'm going to die i'm going to die why am i even doing this and then at the end of the roller coaster ride you come off and go yeah <laughs> i could i could take over the world it's sort of like an extreme example of how good stress makes you thrive and so i really encourage women to to try and find that acute stress that makes them feel better about themselves but at the same time they have to manage the chronic stresses that don't go away that literally eat away your body it's so important to to get a, a handle on those whether that's through lifestyle changes through medication i'm not one of these people that judges women about medication i think it plays a huge huge important role in our lives and it can be a valuable aid at times when it's needed and then the last um, part I like to talk about is like my Brené Brown moment, like the mindset and our how we actually talk about getting older, how we talk about ourselves as women with our new wrinkles and our like maybe bigger waistline and, you know, our just different outlook on life. I just think that that's a massive part of the puzzle. We're always so down on ourselves and that has to change. Yeah, uh, it's a waste of time, you know. It's a waste of time. We just need to embrace ourselves. But, you know, and I, but I do think that, you know, you had mentioned how diet is really important yes. um, as well. And then sleep management as well. Those are your. The, my four, four are nutrition. Yeah, my hacks are nutrition, strength training, um, stress management, which includes sleep and mindset moving forward. They're the, the four areas of focus. And I basically want women to know that while all of the crap of perimenopause is going on and it feels a little bit out of control, these are areas of your life that you actually can control. Even if it's just small changes, and I'm very big on doing small changes for big outcomes. You don't have to do drastic changes, but if you can start taking control of small elements of your life, sort of when you sort of start breaching the other side, like I have, like you're already in a place of like resiliency. You're already in a place of strength and like fortitude moving forward. And I think that you can't undersell that. It's super important for us. And I think that this is, we had talked before the call, how important it is to share this with the men in your life, because <laughs> any man who has any association with women should also know about menopause and what's happening with women. Um, cause as you say, knowledge is power, right? It's only going to make your relationships better with those per people, whether it's professional or personal. Um, you know, my husband, when I went to the gynecologist and I had two years of this dark place where I didn't know what was going on when I met him for lunch afterwards he sat there eager eyed and just said did you find out what was wrong and and I said yeah um I'm in perimenopause and he said I have depression and migraines he went oh my god thank god for that so you're not going to leave me so so like you don't hate me <laughs> and I was like and it was it was actually really devastating to think that he thought it was something that was happening between us and and you know 
menopause is a time of life where we see an extreme high number of divorce rates. You know, like women do these radical shifts in their life because they don't know what's going on. They can't control it. And I'm not blaming menopause, but it does play a big part in a lot of decision making processes that we make. And so I realized from that minute forward, I had to tell him everything and he doesn't want to hear everything. But you know what? I tell him anyway, because I don't want him to be um, sideswiped by anything. I need him to go through this with me. Even my kids, my kids in school, one of them was doing a psychology class and the teacher turned around and said, I was quite pleased about this. Can anybody talk about a time in a woman's life that happens from between the ages of 40 and 55 where they may start seeing a cognitive shift either in their, in their physiological outlook or their mental outlook? And my, husband, my son did this. He was the only person that put his hand up and he went, menopause. <laughs> but, you know, like, it made me realize that it was an important part of a conversation and that, like, it matters. It matters to my children to know that I don't hate being their mother. Right. That I'm, I'm actually struggling. And I can say to them, I'm having a bad day. I'm struggling. I need you to cut me some slack. I need you to help me. Right. And, and they right. And they did. That's yeah. great. That's so great. So yeah. is there anything that you really want readers to walk away with after reading your book? Well, I think that I want them to feel hope. I want them not to feel as though this is it for the rest of their lives because it's it can feel like that when you're knee deep in it. That I want them to know that what they're feeling is very real and very valid because you know, there's a lot of gaslighting happens in the medical community, but there are valuable resources out there that women can use and um, get the right help. Um, and I want them to know that the, um, there's things they can actively do to that they can control themselves. Um, my book is definitely, I know you can, it's a quick read and I know it's an easy read. It was written in that particular way. But I also think it's a book that you can go, what did she say about strength training again? Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a book that people can keep going back to. Absolutely. But I encourage that because I don't want women to read the book and go, I'm going to do all of the 20 things that Amanda's just recommended. I'm actually, actually saying to you, well, no, do one and see how long you can do it for. See if you can maintain that habit for a few weeks. And then if you can, why don't you add something else and see how that makes you feel? So yeah, No, that's so great. I mean, I think, so where can people pick this up? So it's available at all outlets. So Amazon.com is probably the biggest outlet in the US. But I sort of like to encourage people to use their like um, local bookstores and also, you know, their independent bookstores. On my website, Fit and Chips, F-I-T-N-C-H-I-P-S, fitandchips.com forward slash books. I have a list of every single place you can buy them globally because it's going to be released in the United Kingdom and North America and then globally by Kindle. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big lover of um, local bookstores. That's you know, awesome. So I, no, I and so am I. So am I. But it's a great read. There's humor in it. So it's not completely depressing. I encourage you to go read it. Every woman, give it, give it to them for the holidays. It's out October 23rd. It's actually, uh, they've changed the date. It's actually going to be out October 18th, which is World Menopause Day. Buy it for your husband. Who knew? <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you.